Finally, we are talking about some fish today in topic four. So we just finished up a little bit about some marine organisms, but let's get started so we can actually talk about some fish you need to know. So we talked about crustaceans, we talked about cynoderms, we talked about plankton. Now let's talk about fish. So the first one, you need to know the features of a bony fish. I wish there was a really fun way to remember this. Um, I tried to think of something fun before I started this video, but to be honest, I came up with something so lame that I don't want to confuse you. So whenever I think of the dorsal fin, I always think of the sharks going, da 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 right? So that's the dorsal fin. That's what we see sticking out of the water. So it's going to be across the top of the fish. The caudal fin is going to be the largest fin and is going to actually help move the fish forward. So it can help the fish swim faster or slower, guides the fish in speed, swim speed. Then we have the anal fin, the pelvic fin, and the pectoral fin. So I always tell my students when we're sitting in class, think about pectoral like by your pecs, right? Pelvic by your hip bones. And then of course, that's gonna help you figure out where the pectoral fin is in relation to the pelvic fin. Lateral line. That is found on bony fish. So we can actually see it externally on bony fish. The operculum, the operculum actually covers the gills of a bony fish. So if you ever look at fish and you, you know, see their little fins going in and out near their eyes, that's actually not fins. It's called their operculum and it's going to open and close. A level, we talk about why the operculum is opening and closing. So why are bony fish important. So we have the Peruvia, Peruvian anchoveta, which is just a Peruvian anchovy. And um, why are they important for the environment? Well, they're going to cycle nutrients from different habitats. So they're going to excrete or release nutrients. So we know that um, like when we talk about El Nino and La Nina in chapter two, we talk about this Humboldt current that brings up nutrient rich cold water to South America, right? To Ecuador specifically. Now, when we think about this cold water, it's bringing up nutrients. It's also allowing this Peruvian anchoveta to cycle in more nutrients as they are taking in energy from those phytoplankton or any other organism they're going to eat, algaes and things like that. And then of course, when they go to the bathroom, they're going to release nutrients into the environment in the form of nitrates sometimes. And we're going to see that these small bony fish are going to allow for much larger fish, other larger bony fish to eat them. So for example, a keystone species would be the salmon and they're going to um, use nutrients that's given off and they're going to cycle nutrients back into the environment. We need this nutrients in order for us to survive, right? So it works its way up through a food web and a food chain. If we do not have a lot of bony fish, if we do not have a lot of specifically salmon, we're going to see that there is going to be a lack of essential fatty acids and proteins in many organisms diets, which means it's going to be very hard for them to function. Remember chapter three, we talked about what is essential for organisms they need carbon, it's found in everything. They need nitrogen, it's found in, well, proteins and DNA. Also, we need to have phosphorus because that's going to be our main source of ATP, which is energy, but also we need it for DNA as well. Now, economically, right, why do we need them to generate money? Well, we harvest them, which means we take them out of their environment and we use them for trading. We also cook them, so we use them for nutrition also. This, they're a really good source of protein and they have five essential amino acids. Now, people also go sport fishing, scuba diving, snorkeling. We have them in our aquariums or even in maybe saltwater tanks. Now, the non-edible parts, they are also used. They can make glue, paint, candles, animal feed, and fertilizers. So economically, they do generate money, whether we are consuming them and using them or using them for other parts. 
cartilaginous fish. So this cartilaginous fish is actually facing the opposite direction of the bony fish, but the fins are essentially the same. So it goes dorsal fin, dun -dun -dun -dun, right on the top, right? So the dorsal fin stays in the same place. Caudal fin is going to be the large fin on the back. Then we have anal fin, pelvic fin, pectoral fin. Something that is different about a cartilaginous fish that you need to know. Cartilaginous fish are not covered in scales. They are covered in denticle. These denticle literally make the shark feel slick. So if you've ever felt a stingray, maybe you were at a petting zoo, right? And they feel very slick. That is because they are covered in denticle, very tightly overlapping. Now, they also have gill slits. On a bony fish, we just said they had operculum. Well, on a cartilaginous fish, they have gill slits, no operculum. So in A level, we will talk about how the fish breathes when they are cartilaginous, but you do need to know the features of a cartilaginous fish. So our example will be a blue shark. Now, environmentally, right? When we're talking about ecology, they're going to occupy a very large variety of marine habitats. They're usually going to be top level predators and sharks actually promote biodiversity. So remember, biodiversity is amount of different living organisms in the entire environment. They're also going to maintain a balance between predator and prey. So yes, they are a keystone species. Yes, they do control invasive species, but sharks will after actually go after slow dying, not like organisms that, well, we don't really want in the environment because it doesn't promote a healthy environment. Sharks will actually get rid of them for us, which is a good thing. Economically. So money, right? There's a ton of overfishing with cartilaginous fish between game fishing. Sometimes we catch them by accident. Um, they are an economic benefit because of ecotourism. Obviously, we charge tourists to go see, you know, cartilaginous fish like sharks um, and manta rays and things like that. Um, food and lodging. Now, the gelatin is actually used by the fish fins and they are a culinary delicacy, which just means that it can be used in certain cuisines. We use shark in leather, cosmetics, vaccines, and other medical purposes. So one main um, medical purpose is shark liver oil. Shark liver, or liver oil um, used to help treat leukemia. Now, in the phylum chordata, okay, so we just talked about the bony fish and we talked about the cartilaginous fish. Now, let's group them together in the phylum chordata. We are also part of the phylum chordata. So humans are part of the phylum chordata because we have a spinal cord. So chordata is spinal cord. And we actually share with cartilaginous fish and bony fish early developmental features like a notochord, a dor dorsal neural tube, pharyngeal slits, and a post-anal tail. So us humans and other organisms that are in the phylum chordata all share similar features at very early stages of development. All right, folks, that was a lot for today. Make sure you go back, rewatch this video, look through the learning goals a couple of times, and then give yourself a little quiz. See if you can remember just what the structures are, or the features are on a bony fish. What are the features of a cartilaginous fish? And then of course, what features do we all share being in the phylum chordata? All right, folks, I will see you next time.